Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Yeah, you give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I Searching for answers only you can provide Cause you know just what we need before we say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are And I'm loved by you, it's who I am it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You 
are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am. To I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Uganda and India and other places that are staying with us. You're an important part of us. I don't say that to you often enough. This week is Numbers uh, Lesson F, and we'll start in Chapter 15 of Numbers. And as as, as you open to Chapter 15, uh, I would remind you that that where we're at, where Israel is at, is is you know God has been preparing them for two years in the wilderness after leaving Egypt and. He's got them right to the, they finally started moving uh, from Mount Sinai, and, and they've now traveled this 11-day uh, journey. They're right on the border of the Promised Land. Uh, in the last lesson, as we looked at them, they, they'd sent the 12 spies ahead of them into the Promised Land to, to check out the land, and, and when they came back, 10, 10 of the 12 who went, because of fear, because they saw giants, they, they gave the rest of Israel a bad report. They're saying, basically, don't, don't go in there. Let's, let's not go into that land because there are giants there, and, and we don't stand a chance. Uh, they're, they're huge. And that's all except for, for two. We had Joshua and Caleb who, who were on the other side of the opinion, and they were saying, look, God has given us the land. Let's go in and and take it. We're able to take it because God's on our side. Well, you know, we understand something about human nature. We know who we are. Who do you suppose that the people listen to? Well, they listen to those with the with the bad report, with the negative attitude. They listen to those who were in the majority, thinking probably uh, that you know, there's only two that were telling us this foolish message that we can take this land. It, the other ten can't be wrong. We need to listen to them. And, and uh, we looked last week, 
So concluding that God had led them astray, they began to murmur and complain against him, saying, saying, oh, poor us. How many, how many people know someone who likes to go there all the time? Oh, poor me, I have it so bad. Life never gives me a, a fair shake. Everything always goes wrong. These, these folks were right there. They're saying it would it have been so much better for us if God had left us alone and let us live our lives and die in Egypt. We'd been so much better off if we'd have lived a lifetime of slavery and died in that. Well, we saw it. that was a big mistake. And they were grumbling, they were accusing God of bringing their children out into the wilderness so they could perish in the wilderness. The mistake is that God knows and hears everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He, he knows everything, he hears everything. And he knew what the people of Israel were saying, and his response was basically, if that's who you think I am, then that's who I will be. You will die in the wilderness. You'll have your wish. That is, everyone who's 20 years old and over, the adults of you, the ones who should know me, who should be responsible, you will die in the wilderness. But I do love your children. And they, they will have the promised land that I've promised. But he passed a sentence on them that they would wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a, a year for every day that the spies had been in the land, and that after the 40 years that their children would have the promise, they would realize the promise. That's, that seems pretty severe. It seems a severe punishment that God would deny these people from entering into the promised land. But you have to understand that to accept the fullness of God's love, you have to sometimes accept the severity of his punishment. Both go hand in hand. It's springing forth from that decree of God that they would, that the adults would not enter into the promised land, that the children would. Now, chapter 15 opens with, with a promise of God. Chapter 15 opens with a promise of God just on the other side of his punishment. And great, grace and judgment are like the opposite sides of a coin with, with God. They're always that close together. Wherever you see his judgment, there is his grace is. And if you see his grace, his judgment lies waiting for disobedience. So chapter 15 opens with a promise from God that these people of Israel were demoralized at this time. They were demoralized because God just gave this sentence that you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. You adults will not enter into the promised land. You remember, they, after God passed this judgment, they even tried to enter on their own without him, and, and several of them were killed. The people who were already living there defeated them. So verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 1 says, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel, and saying to them, When ye come into the land of your habitations, which I give to you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, and performing a vow or a free will offering, or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd of the flock. So, so right here, God told Moses to speak to the children, the children, not the adults, the children of Israel, about how they will make sacrifice when they come into the land. Now, the promise is right there. He didn't say how they will make sacrifice if they come into the land. He said how they should make sacrifice when. He assured the young people of the nation that they will enter into the land just as he promised to Abraham that his descendants would receive the land. God's word is true and God's word will be fulfilled. These adults wouldn't make it, but their children would. But there's, there's so much to that statement. There, there's so much in that promise to the children of these Israelites. They love their kids just as you do. When you come into the land is also the statement that would allow these people to wander, to endure wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. You have to understand some things. It was an 11-day walk from Mount Sinai. Any of these people could have walked away from Israel during this 40 years to live their lives out with, with a pagan society. 
They could have walked away. But something kept them there. They chose to stay with Israel. They chose to stay with God, spend their lives in the wilderness so that their children could have a portion of the promise that God had made to them. We're not, we're not told, but it's quite possible that a few of them did walk away. I don't know, I don't know that. I can only speculate. But I do know, I, I look at their situation, I look at our situation, and I know there are people who in our day have been part of a church and who have chosen not to wait on God's promise because it's just too hard and have chosen to walk away. Walk away from the church and walk away from God's promises. You know, I, I, I try to grasp these things and you know, what does the promise of God do to someone mentally? How does, how does grabbing on to the promise of God enable someone? How does pr- grabbing on to the promise of God enable someone to stay with Israel in the wilderness for 40 years? Well, I, I turn to the New Testament in Acts chapter 12 and, and I see a story about Peter. And, and you know the story. Uh, at that point in, in the history, King Herod had just killed James, the brother of John, and he was, his plan was that that had pleased the Jews so much that in the morning he was going to kill Peter. Well, the night before Peter was to be killed, the text takes us with him in prison, sleeping. In prison, sleeping. He's chained there between two guards, sleeping. And when you read that, it should seem odd to you that a man who is, by the decree of King Herod, living his last few hours, would spend those last few hours of his life getting a good night's sleep. That's what, it, that's what the situation looked like. But the situation was different to Peter. Peter knew what King Herod had planned for him in the morning. Certainly he knew that. But he put his faith in the promise that Jesus had made. It changed everything to him. It changed his perspective. It gave him confidence. This confidence that allowed him with a death sentence to sleep peacefully. You know, at the Sea of Galilee, the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after his resurrection in John chapter 21, verse 18... Jesus said this to Peter. He said, when you were young, you girded thyself and walked wherever you wanted to go. But when you shall be old, you'll stretch forth thy hands. Jesus told Peter, you shall be old. The Lord said he would grow old. So here's Peter just a few weeks later in in prison, sentenced to die and he didn't surely know what the morning was going to bring or how God was going to work it out, but he had confidence that he was not going to die at the hands of King Herod in the morning because Jesus Christ had told him, you shall be old. It changed everything for him. It changed a desperate situation into one where Peter was being guarded by two Roman guards. He was safe and he might have gotten the best sleep he ever had. He's in perfect safety. Because he grabbed onto a promise of God. And I'll tell you what, you would have a lot less worry and anxiety in your own life if you would trust in the promises of God. If you grab onto them and, and know that the promises of God are sure, that they're a surety to you. So here was, here was God saying to the children of Israel, when you get into the land, the promise being that you will enter into the land So wanting the best for their children, the adults of Israel would spend the rest of their lives in the wilderness waiting on the promise of God for their children instead of wandering away on their own. They'd spend the rest of their life preparing their children for the day that was coming when they would move into God's land of promise for them. Uh, We won't look at a lot of chapter 15, verses 3 through 31, or Moses detailing what the offerings were going to be when the children got into, into the promised land. And Moses recorded those things so they would know them 40 years later, 38 years later. 
Well, how do, how do I know that Moses recorded them for him? Well, I, I know, first, I know because you're reading the words that Moses wrote, the reading of those promises. But there in verse 23 of, of chapter 15, it says, The Lord hath commanded you by the hand of Moses. The Bible even proclaims that Moses wrote these things down. Uh, from the day that the Lord commanded Moses, and henceforth among your generations. So, so the Bible even tells us that Moses recorded these things so these, this younger generation would know what they were to do when they eventually got into the promised land. Then, then there in, in uh, of this chapter 15, verses 22 through 29, right there, God makes some provisions uh, for making offerings to atone for sins of ignorance. Again, God's punishment sometimes is severe, but his grace outshines it. That there's provision for sins of ignorance. How fortunate it is for us that God is willing to forgive us for sins we're not even aware that we are committing. And you might say, well, if, if I don't know I'm committing a sin, maybe it's not a sin. Well, if you just drove past the speed limit sign that said the speed is 40 and you're going 70 and the police officer pulls you over... Is your ignorance an adequate excuse? Probably it's not. I know, because I've talked to the police about it. <laughs> not too long ago. <laughs> so, so sins of ignorance are, are sins nonetheless, and, and, and they too are in need of forgiveness. At, at verse 30 in chapter 15, it says, But the soul that doth uh, ought presumptuously or the soul that sins willingly, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproach the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That soul shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. And Misty, I think right there is a partial answer to your question in Sunday school. Is it not? That, that Someone who sins willfully and knowingly uh, should be cut off, and and this is a, this is a maybe not a one-off situation, but this is speaking of someone who uh, knowingly is routinely disobedient to the word of the Lord, and and here we're told once again if someone makes a choice to walk away from God to sin openly and knowingly, he's to be cut off, and he should be cut off from the church. That if you know someone in that situation, you shouldn't even be entertaining conversation with them until they come to a point of repentance. Because there's a danger. There's a danger in you having fellowship with that person. Because in that fellowship, you might unwittingly accept their position of disobedience. It might begin to affect you. We've been looking at all these negative things that are so contagious. And having conversation with, with the, this person might jeopardize your own relationship with God. It might taint that relationship. It might jeopardize your relationship with the church. Such rebellion is contagious. Such rebellion is contagious. Numbers 15.32 says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering his sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. They put him inward, or they arrested him basically, because it was not declared what should be done to him. So under the law that God had given them, he never said what should be done with someone who do you find working on the Sabbath day. And right here you begin to see that even though Israel is so unfaithful to God, that they're so rebellious, that they're so doubting, that they're are so grumbling, you see that they are becoming a religious nation under the laws of God. That they are people who follow the laws of God. That even when their faith in God was weak, they were becoming religious. And these religious people had found a man who on the Sabbath day was in violation of the Sabbath day rules that God had imposed not to work. And they didn't know what to do with him because God didn't say specifically what to do with him. So they, they confined him. They put him in jail, if you will. And Moses consulted with the Lord, and, and the Lord said, stone him. Kill him. And wow. 
Right there, we think that's, that's really harsh, that this man was put to death because he was gathering sticks on the Sabbath. Again, you see right here the severity of God. God needed these people to be rule followers. He needed them to be religious. He needed them to see the severity of his justice so that they would remain confined to his laws. He needed the pure bloodline that was going to produce Jesus Christ to be rigid to these laws so that they didn't get used to going outside of the law and start start taking husbands and wives beyond the confines of their tribe and start taking foreigners and you know the first the first step over the line leads to the next step over the line and the line keeps moving further away god had to be severe with these people he had to be severe to enable the bloodline to remain pure so jesus could become our kinsman redeemer and when you understand these things you you know some the detractors of of the bible the detractors of of Jesus Christ would say, well, here's, here's one of those conflicts in the Bible. There's contradictions all over. They say here, here in the Old Testament, God said, kill this guy for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Yet Jesus was always doing things in the New Testament. The Pharisees were going out of their minds because Jesus kept healing people on the Sabbath. Under God's law, maybe Jesus should have been stoned. If God's consistent, but he is consistent, you have to understand the purpose. You have to understand the pure bloodline. What was the difference? The difference was Jesus had already arrived. There's no need, there's no overarching need to keep the bloodline pure because Jesus was here. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for, the, for man, not man for the Sabbath. And you understand the pure bloodline, you start understanding the deeper context of even that statement. That the Sabbath and all the Old Testament laws work together to make the Jews this rigid nation of law abiders who would only, as I said before, marry within the confines of their own tribes, therefore keeping the bloodline pure. Keep it pure, extending all the way from Adam to Jesus, from, from the first Adam to the last Adam. Was, was the Sabbath day made for man? Yeah. It was made for you and I so Jesus could come. So once Jesus came, there's no need for it. There's no problem with Jesus was healing people on the Sabbath day. It was no problem with his disciples gathering some grain to eat on the Sabbath day. Verse 38 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. So God wants them to remember his commandments and, and be religious. So here's a reminder. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, and you, that when you look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, and that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go whoring, that you may remember and do all my commandments, and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So God here tells the Jewish people to put fringes or tassels on the ends of their robes. And in those tassels would be a ribbon of blue as a visual reminder to them that every time they saw someone's tassel on their robe and they saw that ribbon of blue, it was to mind, remind them of the commandments of God that they would keep them. And go forward in the New Testament and we find this, this curious story of a sick woman receiving healing simply by touching the clothes of Jesus Christ. Matthew 9, verses 20 through 22 says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched. I love the specifics of the Bible. She touched the hem of his garment. Do we know what's on the hem? We do know what's on the hem. 
For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned, around, turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole, and the woman was made whole from that hour. What was so significant about the hem of Jesus' garment? So significant that the Bible tells you that is exactly what she touched. She didn't touch him on the shoulder. She didn't touch him at the waist. She touched the hem of his gar garment. What was significant about it? There are no useless details in the Bible. You need to understand there are no useless details in the Bible. The hem of Jesus' garment in obedience to what were shown here in Numbers 15.38 had tassels of blue ribbon. The woman with the issue of blood knew that if she could only touch, if she could only touch the reminder of the Ten Commandments that this rabbi, this great prophet, as she would have seen him, as he wore, she might receive something of God. She should, by touching the blue ribbons and these tassels on this great man, this great prophet, she could access the promises of God. In so doing, she, for her faith, was healed. And we see, we see in even that, that the promises of God are accessed through the commandments of God. That the commandments of God demand obedience to God. And, and from obedience to God springs forth for us this relationship that we can have with him personally. So the promises of God for you, the promises of God are accessed through an obedient relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, turn to chapter 16. When you get into chapter 16, there's a prominent Levi, a man of the tribe of Levi named Korah, who along with 250 other leaders rebelled against Moses' leadership and his authority. Uh, chapter, uh, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Konath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abram, the sons of Elab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. Now, do you think these people were keeping track of their family? I'd say they're people who are keeping track of their family. Sons of Reuben took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the, above the congregation of the Lord. You know, how did Moses respond? What these guys were saying is, look, we're all holy. Why do you think you're all that? Who made you so special? Well, Moses told the rebels, okay, we're going to have a showdown. Number 16, 23, says, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle. Tabernacle is a tent, a dwelling place. Of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. God told Moses, tell people to get away from their tents. And right there at that moment, you, you should have an indication that something bad's about to go down. <laughs> Step away from the fire, God said. The severity of God's punishment was about to be revealed. Now, now remember a couple chapters back where we've been. This complaining started in Israel, if you remember, with the mixed multitude. Then it made its way through the crowds. It, it found Moses, and Moses started grumbling, and then it found his brother and sister, if you remember. And they started grumbling against Moses. And now we have a, a group of prominent leaders who are also beginning to grumble and complain against Moses. And, and I tell you, God takes this kind of rebellion against, against his leadership pretty seriously. And the same is true for the church today. And, and Jude... Uh, the first verse of, of the book of Jude, right back there before uh, Revelation, 
It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus. Who is that? Who is preserved and sanctified in Christ Jesus? It's us. It's the church. Jude speaking of the church. At verse 11, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Korah. Let me paraphrase that for you. Jude says, Woe to them who speak and challenge God's elect. That will go bad for them. So God had said to Moses, tell everyone to get back away from the tents of these guys. And Moses, after they got back, he said, look, here's the deal. Here's the challenge. They wonder, they wonder why I have all this authority. If these people who are protesting live to die in old age, and obviously, obviously I'm not the guy that I say I am. But if the earth opens up and swallows them, then obviously I'm the guy who God sent to lead you in the discussion. Let's see what happened in, in verse 31. It came to pass as he made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder and that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all the men that appertained to Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. They were buried alive at that moment. I suspect that this moment God had their attention I suspect that I would suspect that Moses would have had their respect maybe maybe not so the sin of this group of 250 people was challenging God's opinion of who should lead trying to divide Israel and so if they were trying to divide Israel maybe it was fitting that God would divide the ground and have it swallow them. Paul, the Apostle Paul would say this way in Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that also he shall reap. And, and you see it in the, this case of Korah, that as they were trying to bring division, the, the earth divided for them. So this, this man Korah thought that he could use this, this literal tidal wave of complaining that's sweeping through Israel, sweeping through the camp to get himself a promotion. But the problem was God hadn't called him to higher leadership. And as I said, God had, certainly had their attention, but amazingly, Moses didn't have their attention yet. In Numbers 16.41 says, But on the morrow, or, or the next day, all the congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation. And behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get ye up from among this congregation, that I may consume them in this moment. And they fell on their faces. So the next day, the people, after Korah was taken down into the earth, the next day the people gathered to accuse Moses of killing the men of God. Moses, how could you do this? How could you kill these right, righteous people? And that, that really kindled the anger of the Lord against him. And Moses and Aaron were such good people that they kept contending with the grumbling of these people against them personally, and they kept interceding. That Moses and Aaron went, went to the tabernacle to plead for the people before the Lord, and Moses said to Aaron, get the incense and get outside because the plague has already started. The people are beginning to drop like flies. Go stand between the living and the dead and make intercession on the account of these people. So it says that Aaron the high priest grabbed the incense and he went out and he stood between the living and the dead to atone for the people. And that there stopped the plague that God was bringing. And right there is a beautiful picture of intercession. A beautiful picture of standing between the living and the dead, which is what you are called to do as born again believers. That those who are not born again, those who do not know Jesus Christ are dead. They are dead in their sins. 
And you're called to stand between them and God and pray and intercede on their part, that you'd be praying for them. Verse 48 says, He stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died in the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague stopped. In chapter 17, after this uprising of Korah, God, God decided he's going to determine, he's going to settle this issue once and for all, who should be leader. Who should be high priest. Number 17, 1 said, The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all the princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, right? Thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the ark of the testimony, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. So this was the deal. Each tribe was to bring a stick, a rod, a stick. And upon the stick, there, each tribe was to write the, their leaders, their tribal leaders' name upon the stick. And they put, put the sticks in the tabernacle before the Ark of the Covenant. And they put Aaron's name, of course, on the, on the stick belonging to the tribe of Levi. And they, they left those sticks in the tabernacle overnight. Verse 8, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses went into the tabernacle witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded. Not only budded, but it brought forth buds and bloom blossoms and yielded almonds. And they kept this rod. I don't, I don't blame them for keeping this rod. They kept this rod of Aaron. And, and this rod was, was placed into the Ark of the Covenant, signifying that God had chosen the family of Aaron for the priesthood forever. So Aaron's rod is, is, if you look at it, is a picture of the resurrection. The, from those who are elected of God, just as you are, you're elected of, of God. That something that was dead comes to life, and that in his rod is a, a picture of what you are experiencing, that you're no longer dead in sin, that you were born again and coming to life. We're all born into sin, and we're all budded into life in Jesus Christ. So the priesthood was validated through Aaron and his lineage by this dead stick coming to life and blossoming. How can you argue that? We put 12 dead sticks in there, and the one with Aaron's name written produces almonds. I mean, it didn't only bloom, it produced almonds. So underneath the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant were placed three things. They, they put their uh, copy of the Ten Commandments, the law, uh, they put a golden pot with manna in it, and they put this this rod of Aaron's, this budded rod, in in, in the under the mercy seat. Uh, in chapter eighteen, we're covering some ground now. In chapter eighteen, God continued to confirm the Levitical priesthood. Amen. So, so in chapter eight, amen to that. In chapter eighteen, uh, God continues to confirm the Levitical priesthood in Aaron's line, to, to continue to say that these are people. In verse six, it says, "And behold, I have taken your brethren and Levites from among the children of Israel. To to you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the priesthood belongs to God, and 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 He gives them to men as a gift. He loans them to us." And God details in this chapter then the wages that were to be paid or paid to the to the uh, Levitical priests. The, the people were to give a tenth of what they had when they came to the temple, and a tenth of that tenth was to go to the family of Aaron, and and the rest of of what was given was to be divided amongst the other Levites, and and that was the way that Levites would receive their pay. And verse nineteen all. All the heave offering for the holy things which the children of Israel offered to the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters, speaking to the Levites. 
with thee by a statute forever. It's a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. So the Lord said, said Here's how the Levites are going to be compensated for, uh, for their work for me, work in the tabernacle. But, but you Levites need to understand that, that when, when we go into the promised land and we divide the land, you're not going to receive any land because I am. I, the Lord, am your inheritance. And that's, uh, let's, let's pray as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I, we, we give you glory for what you're already doing in Rita. Uh, give you all the praise and all the, all the due that you deserve. Father, I thank you for this time we've had together. I thank you that, that Brenda has come forward and, and wants to be a member of this church. More importantly, a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And we're, we're so thankful to have her with us. So, Father, we claim you, and, and we know you claim us as your children. Help us to go out into the world. Help us to help us to walk in the way of Jesus Christ. Help us to find the way. Help us to pull others along with us. Give us the audacity. May your Holy Spirit give us the audacity to speak to someone about Jesus this week. In his glorious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Come back.